Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Final Cut Pro Help Live. My name is Jared Ewing, and we're going to be taking you through some fun things today, but it's all going to be demo. So this episode, we're going to talk about dailies and then go into a Q&A at the end of it. So we're just going to dive right in, go through some stuff here. If there's any questions that you have, don't hesitate. You can put them in the live chat that's happening right now there on YouTube. If you're watching this stream at a later date, which most of you probably are, don't hesitate. You can still leave a comment on the video, but if you have a specific question or maybe something you don't want to post publicly, you can always email it to finalcutprohelp at me.com, and we're here to help. We're also on Twitter, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look for at finalcutprohelp. So that's my little intro here, and let's dive into it. So we're going to talk about dailies. So what are dailies? Uh, you might have heard of this term just being thrown out there. If you've worked on productions or been anywhere near a film set, you might have heard this, also called rushes. Uh, but basically, all dailies are is all of the footage that was shot in a given day. So this is going to be directed at people newer to working with dailies and for you editors out there and specifically the ones using Final Cut Pro, as you would have guessed, that's what this channel is all about. So we're going to look at some dailies. We're going to actually look at some footage from a film and go through it. I want to show you the site that I got this footage from. It's just editstock.com. Uh, editstock provided this footage to me for free to use in this demo here. But essentially what Edit Stock does, they sell footage from actual productions that they've worked on. You're going to get all of the raw footage, uh, including some other documents, which we'll look at in the specific film I got here. Uh, but definitely go onto their website here. Just, again, editstock.com. You can click on View Films to view all the films that you can work with here. Um, and it's not just uh, movies and films. They also have documentaries, music videos, weddings. Uh, and this is just footage that you can use to hone your skills to get better at what you do. It's really hard to edit when you don't have any footage. So this is a great way to get some stuff and edit things for your reel that you can use uh, and, and show to others out there. So the footage that we're going to be using is actually from this film uh, just titled Overtime. It's a short film. And we're going to be looking at some of the, the clips from that one. So uh, again, definitely check them out, editstock.com. They're not a sponsor of this channel, but they did provide me with that footage. So um, I'm thankful and grateful to them for doing that. So what we're going to look at is actually the raw stuff that they give you. And then we're going to well, go back for that. And uh, Frank, thank you for your comment in the chat there. I'll get to that at the end when we get to the Q&A and dive into that part uh, at the end there. So here we go. So I'm just in the Finder, and I put a little shortcut over on the left side here. Uh, just called overtime. So this is a folder of everything that is provided to you from edit stock. And we're going to break this apart and look at it and then go into what dailies are and how that relates to all of this. So uh, first thing here, I do have an overtime Final Cut Pro uh, 10 library. That's something I created. You won't get that when you download it because this is just all raw footage that you can work with and use. So you're going to get this paper uh, paperwork folder. I'm actually going to go into column view here for this to just go through each of these folders. So this overtime paperwork folder is great because it gives you the actual script from this movie. And I'm just going to hit the space bar to quick look this document so you can see this is the script formatted as you would expect a script to be formatted. If you haven't seen scripts in a movie, this is a great way to get familiar with them, and get an idea of what they put in a script before they actually shoot. Uh, anything. So you'll get the script and you also get storyboards, which is nice, broken out into scenes. This film has 12 scenes and that's important because we're going to see that in a, a couple minutes here. We can actually go in and look at these storyboards, see how they shot, get an idea of what the director and the people creating this film, what their vision was before it was even shot. And all of this data is really important to you as an editor. With dailies, it's the things that are being shot each day on set and you're going to be getting this footage, and it's really nice to have an understanding of what the film is. And many editors for their daily workflow, what they go through and do is just watch all of the footage that's coming in so that they know what they have available to them to actually make an edit happen. So uh, that, is, that information is included to you from Edit Stock to help you in, in your editing and to understand kind of what the original people were going for, what they designed and, and created this movie for, and then you can go from there. 
So depending on which film you download, it's going to be broken up into different parts. For overtime, it was broken up into four parts just to be able to download these files. So you might not necessarily have all four of these parts uh, for every film. You might have more or might have less. But when you go into these parts, you'll see a completed cut. Uh, and this is an actual cut of the film as it was presented somewhere else. You'll see some credit stuff and logos. Uh, but then if you go in, you'll see the actual scene. So I'm going to skip over here to part two. So we can see scene one, scene three, scene four. And essentially, these folders are containing the dailies from each of these days. We're going to say that they shot one scene in each day because these are all different locations that they went through. So when we go into these folders, we see the shot um, numbers, and these clips are organized a specific way. So that's kind of the overview of what we're working with here in the Finder. And the reason we're starting the Finder is as an editor, most of the time you're going to be receiving this footage in the Finder, either on an external hard drive or in another format that's not maybe from a server, it might be from somewhere else, but you're not going to see it first in Final Cut. That's not just where you're going to start. So when you're working with dailies on a, on a film or another production, whatever it might be, uh, this is how they're going to look. They're not going to be you know, nicely laid out inside of Final Cut. You're going to have to start working with them. And with Edit Stock, they provide the footage somewhat organized. I mean, we already have really nice folders here for each scene. And when we go into it, each shot and each take, like this is shot 65 from scene four. And this is take one, two, three, going on down the, the line there. So they're all labeled somewhat nicely. But a lot of times, the first thing you're going to want to do with dailies is actually rename them and start to organize that footage. So if it's not organized into folders like this, you can start doing that as you get it off of the set. And you might just have raw memory cards with uh, all the shots that were uh, essentially named from the camera, which if you're on a, a higher end shoot, they might be labeled right there. You might have a, a DIT or someone on set that's actually doing this for you. If not lower budget, uh, you might not have people doing this, and you might just have a bunch of kind of generically named shots. So if that's the case, you can certainly come in here into the Finder, organize them through folders, and name them. If not, that's something you can do inside a Final Cut as well, and we'll see that in, in a couple minutes here. So um, again, first thing, you're going to get these dailies. They're going to be essentially a group of shots, and you're going to want to start to name those and label those. And usually when you get to the labeling and the names, uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can name these clips. Uh, I do like these because they're labeled with the scene number first, and then you have the shot number, and then the take after those. But this one clip, if we look at it, we know it's scene uh, four, shot 65, take one. But there's no other data in this name. So in some cases, you're going to have names that have the date of when the shoot actually happened. You might have the project name included in that name uh, and many other numbers to make it easier for you to read what those shots are. So this is something that's going to be specific to uh, your shoot or even just your company. If you work at a company, they're going to have a way of naming and labeling those shots. Make sure you understand what those are. And to give you a little bit more information here, I'm going to hit the space bar to quick look this shot just so you can see the beginning of this because they do slate these shots. And that's what's nice about working with this stock footage. If you haven't been used to working on set, you might not be used to using slates in some of these more advanced uh, features that come out of this versus just working in a school or somewhere that's a little bit lower budget. But here we can see the name of the project, which is overtime. We see the scene, shot, take number, which we had in the, the title, which was labeled for us. But if it wasn't, we get all that information here from the slate. Um, and you can see some other information about the camera, audio, all that on there as well. So um, that's the first thing. Hopefully you're getting an idea of what dailies are. Just all of the footage shot in a specific day here. So uh, we're actually going to use this scene four, pretending that today is the, uh, the, the shoot where they did scene four here. And this is all the information or the dailies we got, all these shots here. And we're going to use Final Cut to organize them. So before you do anything, this is kind of a side note, but probably the most important step that you could do with dailies. Uh, ideally, before it gets to you at the edit suite, it's been backed up. It's been copied somewhere. If it has not, you, you got to make a copy of this information. I mean, this data here, uh, it's 
essentially for this film, I mean, it's everything from that day. So if this data gets lost, erased somehow, that's not a good thing. And if you've listened to any of the, my other streams, you know that I'm very heavy on uh, making a backup, making sure you don't lose any information because I've been through it so many times with so many different people. Uh, as a technician, people coming to me and you know they have a hardware issue, something's broken, no big deal, we can fix that. But if your data gets corrupted or lost, we can't bring back back. We can't recreate that as technicians after the fact. So uh, make a backup, make a copy of it before you do anything else, before you bring it in a Final Cut, anything else. Even though Final Cut, you can create backups. Uh, it's usually easier to have some kind of a workflow to make that, that copy there. Um, the other part, just as far as backup goes, backups can't be on the same computer. If you just make a copy in the finder to somewhere else on the same hard drive, it's not backed up. If that hard drive crashes, you still lose everything. So you want to make sure that your backup situation is laid out really nicely. If you have any questions about that, uh, don't hesitate. Give me a message. Uh, reach out to me. I can help you with your backup plan if you need that. Um, cool. So that's just a little side note. So once you have your backup and your, your data is copied somewhere else, uh, you can definitely go in here like we looked at, use the finder to organize the files and the clips. Uh, but you don't have to do that because you can go into Final Cut and do that. So we're going to start from scratch in Final Cut and bring these shots in and look at organizing them. Uh, even though this, we're going to start with scene four here, you never know, you might be shooting out of order. So it doesn't matter when your footage is being shot. It could be shot at any time and then you can use Final Cut to organize it. So uh, how do you actually do this? So when you open up Final Cut Pro 10, here we are in Final Cut, you may come to a previous library that you were working on. In this case, it's the stock library that I usually use for the demos. Um, and what I recommend doing is going up to the name of the library. In this case, it's just stock at the top left here. Control click or right click on the name of the stock library. And there's an option to close that library. You can also have it selected and go up to um, the, what is it, the file menu here. And there's an option to close it as well. Uh, once you close that library, uh, Final Cut's going to be empty. You're going to have nothing in it. And you can click on this Open Library button on the left side. Or again, go up to the file menu and you can, you can open one. And you're going to want to create a new library. Brand new, you just got dailies for a new shoot. We're going to create a new library for that project. It's going to ask us where we want to save that. And I'm going to save it actually here in my uh, Overtime folder that I created for this project. And I'm just going to call the library Overtime 2. Just going to have one already there. So this is just our second Overtime. And I'll click OK to create it. Today is the first of the year, so we get a new event here with today's date on it. And you may want to create a new event for each scene. Uh, this is where your organization part, uh, you can watch the whole live stream we did on organization. Um, depending on how you want to organize footage into Final Cut, you can do that by doing different events uh, for each scene. Uh, or you can have one event for your entire film. In this case, this is a short film. So it's not going to be uh, multiple hours or days worth of footage. There's only 12 scenes in this movie. So I'm actually just going to create one event inside this library for the, the movie here. And so I'm just going to call this event over time. Uh, I could call this scene one and have a different event for each scene, but uh, I'm not going to break up the library that way. So in, in this case, short film, that's, this is usually how I'll organize those. And now it's time to actually bring in uh, the dailies. So to do that, I'm going to hit the import button. And this is going to bring up our media import window. Um, on the left side here, I'm going to go into the external drive because that's where I have all the overtime footage. And let me just dig down into that. Actually, have it up one level. I believe it's in my fifth folder. Here we go. So here's the overtime folder. And I'm bringing this off an external hard drive. You may be doing the same, which you could do from devices. If you're bringing it off of a mem uh, memory card or another um, camera, maybe you've directly plugged that into the computer here to bring that stuff, you'll see that up at the top. But in my case, here's my folders. I'm going to go into the part two folder. And here we're going to use scene four. And there's all the different clips here. So before even bringing this footage into um, Final Cut, if I've named these shots in the Finder, when I go here to the import window, all of this stuff is already named for me. And I can just do click, shift, click to select all of the shots from that day. Remember, all, all the footage that you've captured in that day is the dailies. So here's all the dailies for that day. 
And then on the right side, we get the option to add it to an existing event, which we are gonna do. We're adding to that overtime event that I created. And down here, we get an option to copy the files or leave the files in place. And this gets a lot of people tripped up. I like for newer editors to always use the option copy to library. And here's the reason, that library is gonna contain all of your footage, your projects, everything related to this Final Cut Pro 10 library will be stored inside of one file. Essentially, that's the way it looks inside of the Finder. So if you don't wanna be super technical and have to worry about where all these files are and managing them, using copy to library is a great way to do that. You could choose leave files in place. And what that would do is leave them inside of that folder. If you remember, I had that part two folder with the scene numbers. It would leave them in those folders, and that would be the actual links that are used inside of Final Cut. I don't want to go too far into this part uh, and breaking this up, but if you choose to leave them in place, and we go back to the Finder, if I were to delete any of these out of this folder where they're stored, Final Cut would lose them. Whereas if you use copy to library, Final Cut is organizing all that content for you and making it harder uh, for you to accidentally delete stuff. If you're very familiar with the way Final Cut works and the way files are linked behind the scenes, uh, it can be a lot easier for you to use the leave files in place option. So that's what those are. Again, related to the daily workflow, when you get your dailies, uh, if you get them, say, off of an external hard drive that came off of set, and you chose leave files in place, it would leave them on that external drive. And then when that external drive gets unplugged and goes maybe back to set to get new footage, uh, all of the dailies then go back to set and you've, you don't have them anymore. So that's where you don't want to necessarily leave everything where it is originally. You want to copy it to uh, your library or manually move it off of the drive into where you want to store that. I know that, that part, especially if you're newer, can be very confusing. Um, that's why I usually recommend the copy to library. Okay, next step we have is keywords, and that's gonna be coming from the finder tags or from the folders. So I really like this if you've organized the content uh, in the finder, then when you import Final Cut, it can actually look at the folders where these things are stored and create keywords for them. So I'm gonna keep that turned on specifically for the folders. I didn't add any tags, so I can actually uncheck that. But for the folder, it's saved in that scene four folder, and it'll actually create a keyword for us, and that's gonna be less work down the road. Uh, we then have audio roles that it can assign to, and if you want to, you can have transcoding happen automatically. Uh, I talk a lot about proxy workflows in other streams and other videos, uh, so you can have this checked and it'll automatically start creating proxies for you without you having to do anything, making it easier to edit offline and, and mobile. So um, I'm not going to do that here just for this demo, but definitely something you can do for an easier workflow and kind of managing those. In the past, the, usually the DIT would have to convert these files and might be actually setting up the proxy workflow for an editor, uh, or the DIT would deliver all the footage, and then the editors, the first things they would do is convert these clips into either an optized file or the proxy files. And now all of that's been built into to Final Cut, so you don't have to do that manually. Uh, so that's that, that part. Same thing with the next checkboxes. You can have Final Cut start analyzing all of the clips to do things like balance color, finding people, doing some of the organization for you. Uh, for me personally, I like to do that stuff manually when I need it. I find I do a better job of doing that stuff myself versus Final Cut maybe doing the balance color automatically. Just in my workflow, the dailies come in, it's the raw video. I want to look at the raw footage. I don't want any of the balanced color or some of these other things added automatically. Uh, so I usually keep those unchecked, and then it's less work for Final Cut. Uh, especially the daily stuff, the reason they're also called rushes is a lot of times you need these things done fast. So that's where the less things you're transcoding and analyzing, the faster you can get this process taken care of. Okay, so that's the import window. We've selected the footage. I'm just going to hit import all. And now we're bringing those files into Final Cut. Notice uh, at the top left here, we have our, again, the Overtime 2 library, which just has the one event, and all of those clips we just imported are inside of this event. If I hit the little disclosure triangle next to that event, uh, we don't have anything yet with the, uh, the um, folders or structures below that, but we're actually going to create that. Because remember, we added some keywords to these clips, so we're actually going to go in and start organizing and creating those. 
for us. So um, cool. So now with dailies, you're not editing a project yet. You're not going to be building a, a rough cut or anything like that just yet. Really, the point of getting this is to understand what footage you got off of set that day. So I'm going to hide the timeline at the bottom uh, just by hitting this button at the top right. It's the middle of these through to, to hide the timeline. Uh, as a little pop-up shows, you can also use Control Command 2 as the shortcut to hide the timeline. I usually make the uh, the uh, viewer a little bit bigger, uh, or sorry, a little bit smaller, so I can see the uh, our library here where all of our clips are. Make that a little bit bigger. Um, in my case here, I only have one display. Uh, my actual setup has multiple displays, and I'll usually show this viewer on a second display, which you can do with this button at the top right. You can just go here and choose the viewers on a second display if you have a second one connected. And that makes it really nice because then you can see all of your clips on one display and then the actual video, the viewer here, you'll see that on the second display nice and big so you can review this footage. Uh, you might be working with other people on your team and they can see it as well nice and large. So um, cool. So then at the top right of our viewer, um, or sorry, our browser here, we can organize this footage. Right now it's organized by the type of footage. So we can see an audio file at the top and then all of our scenes in the, the QuickTime movies are here. Um, so it's organized by the file type. It's a weird way to organize, but that's how it's set. So we might wanna go into either date imported, the scene number, roles, all of this other data here. We can actually click on that to organize it based on uh, that category, whatever you want it to be. So really working with these dailies now is just a little bit of organization. And this, I don't want to go too far into this because we're going to actually get, move over to organizing more and into actual editing. But a few quick things about the way Final Cut works. And when you're working with these dailies, a lot of times you'll just be viewing this footage and watching what you've uh, captured that day. But you might be marking things and you want to be starting to take notes about the content and the footage that you have. So you can do that a few ways. As you're watching something, you can definitely click and drag across part of a clip and hit the F key to mark it as a favorite. Uh, if you also see a take that you know you're not going to use, you can click and drag across that take or even part of a take. So like I know this starts out really with him walking up. So I'm going to click and drag to get rid of this first part and just hit the delete key to reject part of it. Right, so you mark parts as favorite, you can reject some, and you're doing a little bit of organizing while you're watching all of these dailies and while you're going through and starting to get a, an idea of what your content uh, is and what it's about. Um, so we could do that. Let me go up here and change our, our grouping. Uh, let's group it based on the scene. So this is important because notice right here we get no data. And if you remember, all of these clips are from scene four. So I can just click on the first clip, hold shift. I'll go all the way down, including the audio clip at the bottom, and click on it to select all of those clips. And then going into the inspector here, we have the information inspector. And get things like name and some other information or some other data here. And if you go all the way down, there's this basic drop-down menu. It might say something different, depending on what you've selected here. Uh, but this is the metadata that you can see over here on the right side. And I usually set this to general, and you can always create your own metadata views. But if you go to general, it gives you the real scene, take, uh, angle, name, and number. It gives you these other uh, metadata fields here. So I know these are all scene four. So I'm going to click on the scene number, hit four, uh, hit tab to go to the next field. And now all of these uh, clips, I've marked them with scene four. They're the dailies coming in. Again, we're just organizing. We're applying metadata to each of these clips. So they're in scene four. If I wanted to, I can now go over uh, in my event on the, the library sidebar there. Uh, I can go up to File, New, and create a new Smart Collection. I could also do it with keywords if you wanted to. Um, but in this case, I'm just going to do a Smart Collection for scene four. And this is just for my organization sake. And this is usually what I'll do with the dailies. I'm just starting to put data into uh, Final Cut so that later on it's easier for me to find things. And with the Smart Collection, after you name it, you can double click on it. And the Smart Collection is just looking for specific fields, specific data that you put in. So I'm going to add a field. And I'm going to go down here. Maybe we'll do text uh, for this. And text is going to include scene. 
uh, see four. Actually, I could just do the number four because I put that in, and it'll put all of those there. Uh, so now I've seen four, it found all those, brought them right into this smart collection. So later on, when I do scene three, I can have that one as well and see that over on the left column. So you can do these smart collections if you want. You can always do a search and manually search for things as you're working with the project. But creating these smart collections or let's do the other one here. We have a keyword collection. You can also do the keyword collection, and this will look for a specific keyword. So we could do scene four here as a keyword. And if I go back to all of my clips, I'll select them all. And I can do uh, command K to bring up my keyword uh, window here selection. And I could just add the keyword scene four to all of these clips. And now same thing, if I go to the keyword for scene four, it throws them in there as well. Uh, this is just up to you the way that you want to organize. Again, we're putting the same data on multiple clips in different ways. So you can either do that with smart collections uh, to have it search through uh, these specific uh, categories and this information, or you can use a keyword, and then you can use the keywords to say anything you want. Um, keywords are kind of nice because it creates those collections automatically as you add keywords to your clips. And you can also label specific parts of clips with one keyword versus another. Uh, so that's an organization there. So um, again, just to kind of summarize with dailies, you're going to use the finder usually to organize them initially, get an idea of what you have, uh, review those clips. You can bring them into Final Cut using the media import window. Uh, you Again, just review everything. Watch your footage. And if you want to, start to mark and label your clips as you're watching them for that first time. That way you are you know, working smarter and not harder. You're starting to organize that content. Um, cool. And then as far as renaming the, the clips themselves, I showed you in the Finder how to do that. I also want to show you here inside of Final Cut. Um, at the top right here of the browser, uh, we have our grouping and our sorting and, and some waveform and some other, other information there. You can change this to the list view if you want to as well. We're in the film strip view right now, which is great for visually just seeing the entire clips. But if you toggle it over to list mode, you're, uh, you're going to see all of those clips again grouped by that scene four number that we put in there. We see the names that came from the finder because the clips were labeled that way. But if you want to, you can just click on these names, wait a second, and then click again to rename them or use the inspector on the right to rename those clips. And this can be very helpful for you to see uh, your footage. If, if you're importing from a camera or card directly and it's just giving them the like file 003 or whatever number the camera named them, it's not gonna be helpful. So you can use this list view to go in and rename those clips. And the other part of this, if you have labeled things with keywords, you'll see if we hit the little disclosure triangle underneath a clip, we actually see that keyword pop up there, uh, which is nice as well. Um, the other part, uh, let me see if we, yeah, here we go. So this clip, we labeled part of it as a favorite. Um, in this list view, you can then go and name the favorite sections. So again, if you want to start adding more data to your project so that when you actually get into editing, it's easier, you can do that here in this list view and put them there. So um, that's what I wanted to say here. Um, again, let me just summarize again, just so you first, before anything, make a backup, and then you can either use the Finder or import those clips here into Final Cut to organize that content and that information. Uh, if you do have sound that was recorded from a different source, you can add markers uh, to sync that uh, audio. So if you do have, uh, like most of these clips here have a slate that go down. Uh, if we wanted to, we could go in and write it the, uh, when the slate is done right there, when the clapper goes down, I could hit M to add a marker. And I'm gonna hit M again to open up that marker. And I could just call this my uh, sync point. Uh, so you can do that as well for uh, sound. You can start to add in sync points and markers that you'll use when you actually get into editing later on to sync that information. Some people do go as far as uh, making compound or synced clips at this point to actually sync them together. Um, that could be a lot of work, especially if you're just trying to view the content. It might be easier just to add those markers in. And then we looked at metadata as far as adding and, and marking parts as favorite or rejecting by hitting the delete key. You could do that in this step as well. 
um, or you can go into your inspector on the right, the information inspector, use the metadata views at the bottom to view specific types of data. Uh, I just use the general view to bring up the scene take and camera angles and numbers, uh, but you can go in there and add in other fields and start to add more data, even notes. Uh, you can do generic notes here if you wanted to, uh, or you can even create a custom metadata field. So if you're working with a specific type of project, you might have something in these scenes that you need to keep track of, and you can do that with custom metadata fields. I talk about that again in the organizing live stream, so I don't want to go too far into that in this one, but just giving an idea of what that's about. So um, yeah, that's kind of the overview as far as dailies go that I wanted to provide. Again, not too much to it. We're just bringing in the information for a scene. So if we go into our second day, I'll just do another uh, kind of run through of that. Uh, if I get that footage, I'm gonna go to the media import window. And you can use Command I if you wanted to use that. Go to the folder of the footage that I wanna do. So uh, let's go, let's see, I think uh, we did scene four, right? So let's go and do the first scene. So first scene has a whole bunch of shots there. I can actually just select this folder and then hit import selected. It kept, notice it kept all the settings I had before. It's gonna get the keywords from the folder name uh, and everything else stays the same. So then I'm gonna hit import selected processing that for import brings it in here I'm in the list view already so I see all those clips but if I switch back to film strip view I can view those clips it's going to generate the thumbnails and it's working behind the scenes to get all of this done uh, if I hit the little disclosure triangle next to no data notice scene four is grouped because I grouped it based on the scene number so I know all these 34 clips I just imported are all of the ones from scene one because they were organized in that folder. So I can just select all of these that have no data. I'm going into my inspector on the right side. I'm gonna add a scene number. This was scene one. Uh, so I just typed in one and then I hit the tab key to exit that uh, field. And now on the left column here, I see scene one and scene four. I don't really have to do anything else, but uh, with all of these clips selected, I could go into using command K, I could go into my keyword editor it put in the, the folder number keyword, but I could say if I wanted to, uh, I'm gonna do scene one here, if I can get it. I've had this happen before where it kind of jumps out. I think that's for my streamer here, but yeah, we'll do scene one, return. And then if I go over and hit the disclosure triangle next to the overtime event, notice now we have a scene one keyword so I could view just the scene one takes at any time and as you grow into a larger project you'll see a whole bunch of scenes there with that part of it so um that's it i mean that's it for dailies uh you just have to repeat those steps most of the time for the editors it's just reviewing that footage and seeing what you have to then start in um, you can see a lot of videos online from different editors and the way that they work uh, and one specific training site that i use that i'm a big fan of is lynda.com and lynda.com does have a series on for filmmakers and you can actually see different uh, filmmakers takes on dailies and what they do some of them do go through and view every single clip so that they know what they have others kind of skim through the footage find the best takes and they start building a rough cut right away uh, there's so many different ways that you can approach this part of the process when you're early on in the editing um, with it but as far as final cut goes you can start to add a lot of data that then you can use in the future to organize and find different things. So, um, yeah, that's what I got about dailies. If you have any questions about that, again, don't hesitate. Put it into the uh, uh, chat below, or you can always send an email to finalcutprohelp at me.com. Uh, looks like everything in the stream is still online, which is awesome. It's good to see. So, Frank, let me take a look at your question here. You said clips in the timeline. Uh, clips in timeline. Okay, so you're saying that the clips that turn uh, turn black. So I've seen this in a, a couple of projects, and I'll try to, uh, to recreate it here. I'm just going to create a blank project here. Oh, look at that. We get Funnel Cut crashing on us. They didn't like that. <laughs> Let me open it back up here. So essentially what it sounds like is when, Frank, when you're uh, working with a project, you might add a clip. And then in the timeline, basically in your actual project, the um, the clips themselves turn black. So uh, essentially what that would look like, if I'm picturing it correctly, notice I've added this um, 
clip here with our keys being dropped down. Essentially here we see them, clip works great, it's blue. Um, blow it up a little bit bigger here just to make it easier for the stream. Uh, like this is obviously how it should look. You should be able to view everything. But essentially what you're saying is uh, this clip is just blank. Uh, so you don't see any of the thumbnails. Uh, and I'm assuming too when you play back the clip, you don't see it in the viewer itself. And uh, that can be a tricky one to troubleshoot and to figure out exactly what happened. Uh, but in these cases, I usually recommend following the uh, general troubleshooting steps that uh, Apple provides. They have an, an article uh, to resolve an issue. And we're just going to search for resolve an issue with Final Cut Pro. And it's this first article here. Uh, I've created a video, this one, the Final Cut Pro 10 resolve an issue. If you hit this missing file video, uh, I walk through step by step all the steps that are used in this article. Um, but usually I recommend following these steps when you're dealing with this problem and, and working through it. Uh, the first and the biggest step is just restarting your Mac. And the reason is a lot of times when I see that problem when they're blank uh, clips on the timeline, because Final Cut is just data behind the scenes. So it's looking for all these clips and it's making the connections saying that this clip is actually this one that's in the browser, which is referencing some file that's on a hard drive somewhere. So in some cases, your computer and Final Cut just get confused about where things are. So if you do a restart, it's going to quit Final Cut, which will also allow that to reboot. Sometimes just quitting and, and reopening Final Cut would fix it. But if you do a restart, if there's any issues with your external drive or where the actual data is being stored, when you reboot it, hopefully all those issues will be fixed and it'll be able to refine where those clips are and where those connections are. Uh, should be made and how to, to reconnect them so that you're no longer getting those blank clips. Um, so as you go through all these steps, again, you can watch that other video to see these steps in detail, but most of the time these steps that you're going to see are actually going to fix that problem. However, with yours, um, step 10 is probably going to be the one that I would I'd recommend doing. And uh, before I get to that, that one's creating a new library and a new project. I think creating a new project is a good troubleshooting step for this. But before you get to that, when you see that blank clip on your timeline, just control click on it or right click uh, if you have a mouse or a trackpad that could do that. And there's an option here to say reveal that clip in the browser. If you click reveal in browser and it shows you the clip up here in the browser, if the browser looks fine and your clip can play back and there's no issues there, it could just be an issue with this project. And so this project, I just called it the blank project. If I scroll up here, here's that project. I could duplicate this project, um, which may fix it. I could say duplicate project or even duplicate it as a, a snapshot. And that might uh, correct it in just duplicating it. But a lot of times, too, what I'll do is actually just create a new project just from scratch. And I'm just going to call it a blank project. And it could be a test or number two, whatever you want to name it. But again, like I said in other videos, always name your stuff, keep things organized. But then if you go into your blank project, the one that's got the just black clips on there where they're not showing up, just do Command A to select all of your clips. Do Command C to copy them, and then switch over your test project and do Command V uh, to paste those same clips in. Uh, ideally, what this is just doing is creating a new project. But essentially, because you've done a, a new project and you're copying and pasting those clips, uh, it's no longer that cor you know, corrupted project if that's the project that's creating those blank clips. And you've just moved all of those clips over into a new project where you can uh, then create that and work with that and start to edit it. Uh, that works for a lot of issues, a lot of weird little transition issues, titles, things that can fix it there. So uh, in your case, Frank, in the chat there, you put in that the browser is black as well. So that means that both your clip on the timeline and the one when you control click it and say reveal in uh, browser, that it's also blank up here. So uh, this is where we might be having an issue with the media itself. But uh, what you can do in your viewer, top right, you have view. And if you remember earlier when we imported the footage, you can there's options there to make optimized media and make proxy media. Uh, this is where you go to choose if you want to be looking at the proxy versus the optimized or original media. So if everything that you're doing right now is doing it in the proxy mode, um, notice here I didn't generate proxies, so we just get this missing proxy uh, 
air message or, or message on there with all the clips. So it's possible that either the optimized or the proxy footage that was created from those files is having an issue. And you may need to regenerate or recreate those files. So you can click on view here and switch between those sources, maybe to see if any change happens um, with those clips. But if there is an issue with the optimized media, uh, if I scroll down on these clips, again, I didn't generate any of those. I just kept the original. But if you do have optimized or proxy media and that is having the problem, you can actually select the clip and go up here to the, um, I think we get it under the edit menu. Let me do the help here. Yeah, it's this one. It was under file. So uh, I don't have any, so that's why it was grayed out. But there's this option here when you have the clip selected to delete generated project files. Um, and that, the essentially what gets generated with these clips, that would be like the optimized media or the proxy media. So you could go through, delete the optimized or delete the proxy and have Final Cut regenerate them. Again, it's hard to know exactly what's wrong with those clips that's causing that, but that's one way. Um, again, this you got to make sure that your original is available as green because then you, you can always get back the original as long as you have that. And then uh, kind of the final thing, I don't want to go too deep into this one because there's so many different levels of it. Uh, but we've looked at the project, we looked at optimized and proxy media and kind of how to troubleshoot those. Uh, but if it's still having issues, you can then right click or control click on that clip and say reveal in Finder. And this will actually show you the original file that you have uh, on your computer, wherever that may be stored. So I can see it here and it's buried inside of that Overtime 2 uh, Final Cut library that I created under original media. But here I can see that original file. And I'll usually hit the space bar to quick look this file. And if you can watch the file here and it seems like everything's working correctly, that it comes up the way that it should be, uh, that's a good sign. Because then you know your original media is OK and not having an issue. Uh, but if there's something uh, wrong with that clip, if you watch it through and at a specific point it maybe skips or is choppy, there may be a corrupted clip that you have there. Um, so let me see here. Frankie said it happens in mid-edit. So if you copy and paste it as you suggested, uh, will all the edits stay or do you need to start over? So uh, that's a great question. So if it's happening mid-edit, um, kind of meaning you're in the middle of editing or if it's a mid uh, like cut or something that's happening there, uh, if you do the copy and paste that I showed, you're copying everything over. So all of your edits should stay the same. Uh, like if you had added transitions or you've made specific cuts when you go through, everything sh should stay the same there. Um, you should not lose any of that information. And let me go back and open up uh, my stock library here because I'll show you on some of the other projects I've created and gone through. So I'll go all the way up here. Uh, let's actually look at the chocolate snapshot project. So this project just has a bunch of clips on it. If I were to do the, the command A, to select all, Command C to copy it. I'll go up to File, New Project. We'll just call this the pro, uh, copy text, test, copy test. And then here I have the empty project, and I'll do Command V to paste that in. Uh, and as long as you're copy and pasting between those projects, everything should stay the same. Uh, and we can see if I go back to the original one, the snapshot here, it looks the same. Here it's the same. I can see the timing is a little bit different. And this is the one thing I want to point out. Because as far as your edit staying the same, everything should stay the same. Uh, the only time it might not stay the same is if you have different formats between your projects. So in this case, my original chocolate snapshot project here, with it selected, if I look in the uh, inspector on the right, I can see the frame rate is 23.98 frames per second. And in my new test here, it's actually 2997. So that's why I have a time difference between these projects. So if you do the copy paste um, kind of <laughs> test I showed you between projects, when you create your new project, uh, just make sure this project matches all of the settings of your previous project. So in this case, I just use automatic and copied and pasted between them. And that's why I got the frame rate difference. So in this case, I would actually want to go through here and just manually set everything up to be the same format as the original project. So I could select my original project, do
do command N to create the new one. Use custom setting. And since I selected the other one, I can see them up here. And so in this case, it's actually a, a 4K project at uh, 3, eight, yeah, that's the right uh, resolution here. And then my frame rate would be the 2398. So I'd select my frame rate. And I'll just say that this is the copy 4K. Hit OK. And if I go back to my chocolate snapshot, do Command A, Command C to copy. Here I'm in the 4K project, Command V. And um, now if you look at the, just looking in the browser here, we can see the length of each of these projects are both five minutes, 26 seconds, and 11 frames. Uh, instead of the 26 seconds and 19 frames, um, now that I've matched those settings. So um, if you are copying and pasting between projects, your edits should all stay the same. The only thing you want to watch out for is those frame rate differences. Make sure the projects match. Uh, you can't change, you can't easily change the frame rate later on. Uh, so you do want to check that uh, when you do the copy and paste between the projects. So um, I don't think we got directly down to your uh, answer there, Frank, but hopefully that gives you a couple of troubleshooting steps that you can dig a little further into. Uh, don't hesitate. You can send me an email, FinalCutProHelp at B.com um, to dig a little bit further in there. The uh, next thing I wanted to go through and show, uh, just in a demo here, I think that I did this in a previous uh, stream, but um, someone asked just how to remove a, a blemish and there's a lot of apps out there to do that. Um, and I am a big fan of Motion, which is designed by Apple and pretty well integrated with Final Cut. And if you're used to Final Cut, a lot of things are going to be similar in Motion. Uh, and then you can actually get a Motion, use Motion to track different things that are on the screen. So if you do have a blemish or something else you're trying to mask out, uh, you can use Motion to track those and then create a pretty nice... Uh, filter or effect to cover those up. So um, in this shot here, this is just a stock footage shot, a little, little tiny blemish on the, the uh, kind of right on the cheekbone there. Um, so if we wanted to get rid of this, we could zoom way in using the viewer here, maybe going to, to 200 or even 400%, and we can go into view one of these blemishes. It can be kind of tricky, but let's just say that this is the, the one we want to mask out or blur. Uh, we can do that. So uh, to do that, I'm just going to select my uh, layer here, the clip. I'm going to hold Option and drag it up. This just makes a copy of that clip, make sure they're lined up. But now on the clip on the top, I can actually go in and choose how I want to either blur this or mask this uh, area here. And you can just use a basic blur filter. Uh, so I could use like a Gaussian blur if I wanted to, for example, and blur that area. And this is a huge amount of Gaussian blur. I'm going to drag this back a little bit. But I could do something like this and blur that area. And then I could go down to masks and we get a draw mask effect. I'll drag that onto the top clip here. And then I can use the viewer here just to drag uh, or draw a mask around. If you click and drag one of these points, you'll get the Bezier handles. So you could just draw a circle or a rounded curve around an area and then you click on the first point to close that little gap. When you're dealing with these points, if you control click on them, you can change them from being linear to smooth, which gives you those handles. So I usually like to have all these be smooth, so I'm gonna control click on each of them and make them all smooth to have them be rounded. And I could go around that blemish or whatever the object is you're trying to blur out. Maybe you have a street sign or something you wanna blur out a logo, uh, you can do that there. And then looking at the Gaussian blur, Again, we could change the amount that we're blurring. Uh, I could choose the boost and change this. And you can see just the, the slight change that you have in there. Uh, however, this uh, with the, the mask part of it, you can see this line. It's going to be really hard to see on the stream. But when you do this yourself, you'll probably see a line where that blur ends. So I usually recommend using a little bit of a feather. Um, you can do a negative feather to, to go inside as well which actually works, I think, a little bit better for this uh, specific example. But you can go either way to feather that area. Uh, and then the last thing that we would have to do here with this mask is we'd actually need to uh, keyframe where this mask is and the, uh, the spot of it. So um, the 
as far as the mask itself goes, we have these transform controls down here. This is where the either the scale, which is the size of the mask, or the actual position is. So we'd want to use the position to keyframe where that mask is. And um, keyframing is a whole topic on its own, but essentially when the mask is where you want it on this specific frame where the playhead is, I'm going to hit the add keyframe button for the position. So notice the keyframe goes golden or orange there, whatever color you want to say, yellow. Um, and then if we go a few frames down, notice our blemish moves. So now I'm going to have to uh, change the position of this. So I'm just going to drag it up. And if you notice in the inspector, it added a keyframe automatically for the position at this frame and where it got moved. So if I go back a few frames, just using the arrow on the keyboard, notice this mask is physically moving uh, for that part as his uh, face moves, and that's what the keyframes are. So you'd have to keep doing this. We'd have to go a few frames down, move it again, a few frames down. I'm just using the right arrow key on my keyboard to go a couple frames to the right, and then I'm using the arrow my mouse just to move that uh, little, essentially the blur around on his, uh, on his face there. So this is a very tedious process when you're going through changes like this. And that's why motion, uh, using the, the motion app can be uh, really useful because it helps you to do trackers and it'll actually do the tracking for you. And a lot of times that tracker works super well. But then if we go back, notice here's that blemish and if I hit the space bar to play this, uh, once here's our blur, the blur kind of follows around for a couple frames there. It's really quick because we only did a short part of it. Uh, but that's one way to remove a blemish using the uh, a blur filter by duplicating this track and then drawing a mask around just the blemish you're trying to remove. Another way to do that, let me copy this track again. Another way to do it that a lot of people uh, don't think of is by using the 360 patch tool. And this one can be way trickier uh, initially, but if you get used to this, uh, 360 patch uh, effect or filter is designed to hide something like a drone, or if you have a 360 camera that's on a tripod, you can use it to hide the tripod mount that's right below the camera. That was the original intention of this effect, uh, but you can actually use it as a way to cover up uh, parts of a clip as well to choose what where you want to uh, hide something that's in the clip. So after you add the 360 patch tool to your duplicated clip, you're going to go into the setup mode, which is just checking this box. And again, it can be really tricky because we're not actually working with 360 uh, clips here. But if I go up to the view uh, menu here and view, bring up my 360 viewer, we'll see if it lets me do it. Yeah, it's not going to let me view it because we're not in a 360 project. So let me hide that. Uh, but in this one, uh, we're ch essentially choosing the part of the region that we want to mask, and then we can cover it up in our, our viewer here. So uh, before I do this, let me see if they have a, a patch region here, because our region is going to be the area of the clip uh, that we want to do it. So I think we can do front will probably be the easiest for this one. No, I guess the right side is where that blemish is. So let's do the right side here. And so we have the green area and the red area. So the red is where the part that you'd want to put on the blemish. And I know it's confusing here, but that's going to be the blemish part. And then this right one is the area of skin or whatever you want to cover up what's here. So this you'd put on a cleaner area of the, the skin or the source. And this radius has to be much smaller. So we're going to bring that down. And so notice here, we'll cover up the blemish. And if I take an area skin that's closer to uh, the area here, you can see how it's changing what's around that spot. But um, we essentially are able to cover that up with the setup mode. And if I exit out of that, uh, let's see before and after, I think it changed where it's covering that spot up. Yeah, it should be. It should be doing it for us. It might have to be rendered on there. But anyway, that's another way to um, cover up blemishes to work for those. And then you would keyframe the region there to have that motion moving around. So uh, that's a couple ways to work with blemishes and remove things and clean footage up that maybe 
we've had some issues with. I know I got a few of those questions uh, came in and wanted to answer that one last show, but got a little busy there. So um, cool. So we looked at uh, using the 360 blur tool. So then Nick on Facebook asked, uh, how can I get text color to match the color of a logo that's on the screen? So this is a really great question, and uh, this is something I do fairly frequently. And let me bring up my logo here. So this is, you might be working with a company or a, um, I mean, really anything, a product. It can be all kinds of different things. And so you have a logo, and I'm just going to use the Funka Pro Help logo here as an example. Uh, but let's say that we were working with this logo. It might be in the corner here. But now we've gone and added some text onto the screen. And, uh, yeah, let's use the dramatic text here, title. And our text here could say whatever it wants. The point is not the actual text. But we want this text color to match one of these colors that's in the logo itself. So when you're looking in the inspector here, you do have under the uh, text inspector here, we have the font color. And when you click on a color, it brings up the color window. And you don't have to use the color window. You could hit this little drop down menu and then select the color in the window here. A lot of people do it that way. But if you click on the little well here to bring up the actual colors, there's an eyedropper here in the corner and the, on the bottom section of this. And if you click that eyedropper, you can then select any color that's on your screen. And this is not just in Final Cut. You could have a logo that's in a PDF file that you're viewing in preview or somewhere else. You can use this as a way to select those colors. So I could go on here and I could click on the yellow of the car that's back there. But if I know I want a specific color in this logo, maybe I want the green that's up in the top left corner, I'm going to go up into the corner here and then click on it. And now notice it's matched the text to that green from the logo. And I see it's set that color here. A lot of times, though, you'll set the color to match, and maybe it doesn't look exactly the way you want it. You want it to be a little lighter. You can definitely brighten that up using the slider at the bottom here. Or you could switch to a different view here to make the brightness, change it. Uh, this is doing it grayscale, but we could change to RGB and, and adjust those as well. Something else that I very frequently do, though, if I select a color in a logo, usually it's a color that I'm going to want to reuse. So let's say I do go in and make it a little bit brighter. I set it to exactly the color I want. In this color window, use the well that's in the lower left corner where you see the color. Just drag this into any of these squares that are on the right side here. And I, that'll actually save that color. So now if you accidentally slip, select a different color, you can just click the green at the bottom there, and it jumps to it. Those are your system colors. You have them. You can use them. Uh, they stay on your computer, and you're there and, and good to go. So that's one way to select a color, match something that's on there, uh, and I use that pretty frequently. There's another app built into your computer, and if you do command space to bring up Spotlight and just start typing in uh, digital, there's the digital color meter app. And this is it here. It's just this little window here that floats up here. And this app actually is kind of what it sounds like. It's going to meter or measure the color of whatever's underneath your cursor. So again, if I go over to the text color or the logo, I can see the color and what it thinks um, the range of that color is based on those values of, in this case, RGB. I could change this and choose a different uh, way of viewing or selecting those colors. And I do this frequently too. Say I have this car here. When I hover over it, it's giving me the red, green, and blue values that are underneath the cursor there. But I can actually change this aperture size, maybe make it a little bit bigger. And now it's measuring more of those yellow colors in a larger box. So it's giving you more of an average of what's on this car. Because maybe one pixel is not enough for you to get the exact match of that car because of the way the camera recorded it, it blurred things. But if you go and get an average, you might get a very close or much closer color reading out of there. So uh, he's asking how to get the colors to match. You can either use this digital color meter to actually measure the values and record those values in, especially if you're working with designers and other people using Photoshop or other apps. You can then share those values with them, and you'll all be on the same page as far as what numbers you're going after and the, the actual color that you want to use. So that's one way to use it, do it. Or just use the eyedropper when you get the color window up, and you can select the color there. 
So Nick uh, from Facebook, hopefully that helps out there. Uh, so the next question we have from Andrea, also from Facebook. He posted to the Final Cut Pro 10 user group, which if you're not on these user groups, they are a great resource. And people are asking questions on those sites uh, almost every hour. I see new questions popping up on the different Facebook groups. Uh, and it's a great place to get information, but there's also a lot of not necessarily bad tips, but just inaccurate information or maybe not the best ways of doing things. Uh, but the ones that do get posted there that are just different ways of thinking about things, you'll get a lot of information from the Facebook group. So uh, Andrea, he's posting on there. He said, I'm struggling to find clear information about moving libraries to another drive. Uh, all I found is that you can move or copy projects, events, and clips to a new library, but not actually move the library itself. And then he's wondering if that's right. So um, this is a, a great question. And in the responses and the comments, David put a comment in there that was pretty detailed, but was almost dead on for, for what I would recommend as well. Um, just to, to summarize, essentially what he's trying to do is take maybe our overtime library or the stock library, and he's trying to move that to another hard drive, either an external drive, or maybe he's moving it from an external drive into his computer drive. He wants to move it, and he wants to know the easiest or most effective way to do that. So um, the first thing I want to say is he's only found ways to move events and projects because if you go up to File, you do have options here to move uh, to a library. So if I select, say, the Museum's Event here, I could go up to File, and I could move that event to another library or copy it. Uh, but there's no options in here for... Uh, storing or moving libraries. And the reason for that is Final Cut, once you're in the library, everything's done in Final Cut. The library itself, you can manage in the Finder. So if you wanted to move a library, say I wanted to move this over time to library, I'm going to control click or right click on it. I'm going to say reveal in Finder. And then when I'm in the Finder, here is that library. And to move it, just simply click and drag that library, this one here, to wherever you want to put it. If you wanted to put it, say, on the desktop of this computer, moving it from the external drive, I would just click and drag it to the desktop, and then it's going to copy that to the desktop. Um, I could also go up to File, and there is an option to uh, move it as well. So you could uh, just simply have it be moved over uh, instead of copied. Um, so that's, uh, sorry, not on the file menu, under the edit menu. When you hold the option button, you have an option here, move item here to a specific uh, uh, folder where you want to put that. Uh, but usually I recommend copying it. That way if something happens weird in the copy uh, and it crashes or something happens, you can still get back to the, the original there. You can always delete this one later on. Um, so that's one way to do that. And I'm going to read David's response here because he, he summarized it pretty well. Uh, but the first thing that David recommended is using a tool by Arctic Whiteness called the Final Cut Library Manager. And um, that tool is, is, a, is a really good tool to use. Um, I'm going to see if I have it. I do have it. Let's open it up here. Bear with me one second while I get this one loaded. I have a lot of projects, and I don't want to put anything sensitive out there, but here we go. So this is the Final Cut uh, Library Manager app, and you can resize the window, make it a lot larger, see all kinds of different projects. But here I see different libraries, and this app allows you to do all kinds of things, including moving libraries and duplicating them, sharing them out. There's a lot of uh, options here. So this tool is one that I would recommend if you want a lot more control than using and manually editing with the Finder. Uh, again, this is called the Final Cut Library Manager app. You just do a web search for it, and you'll find it. And you get a lot of data, a lot of extra information. I wish this was built into Final Cut, but it is a third-party tool, so you want to be careful with it as well. Uh, but that's another tool that you can use. So that's a side note for that one. Uh, otherwise, what David said... Um, as far as using the Finder, because that's what he uses and that's what I use as well. And so he says, in many cases, when I create a new library to work on a video, 
I create a new Final Cut library. And again, we saw that earlier, I created this new overtime library for that project. So once you have that new library, that'll be saved to the computer's internal solid state drive, or, or SSD. And as he imports media and edits the project, all of the assets are saved in this new library. Uh, he enjoys the way that Final Cut Pro 10 organizes events, projects, and media, and everything else that's saved inside the library. And that's the way I recommend as well. When you're new to it, everything gets saved inside that library. Uh, you have a lot less risk of losing something, and you can just do everything right there inside of, uh, inside of Final Cut there. So then uh, once everything's organized, he'll later on he'll go in and he'll move that library off the Mac's internal drive onto a larger external RAID or, or uh, basically a larger storage drive there. And then if he works with the Final Cut Library Manager, it may be great, but however, the projects that he's using in Final Cut uh, might include motion projects, Photoshop, documents, logic projects. When you get to a lot more assets, it can be harder to organize those with the Final Cut Library Manager. So that's where his kind of warning goes in there and as, as far as using that. So um, to summarize, the question was how to move libraries to different drives. In my opinion, use the Finder. Just go into the Finder, and you can then move those projects wherever you want just by dragging them around. Uh, you can also use the Final Cut Library Manager by, by Arctic Whiteness. Uh, it just can be, it's only moving libraries. It's not dealing with a lot of other assets that you have here. Um, cool, so let's do one more question here, and then that'll be it for this first stream of the new year. Uh, we have someone that uh, downloaded the adjustment layer, which if you don't use adjustment layers inside of Final Cut, it might be time to do that. And you can just go to anawesomeguide.com. Hopefully I typed that in right. But if you go to anawesomeguide.com and click on the Downloads tab, you can download an adjustment layer template because that's not something that's built into Final Cut, but something that you can get there. So this person d was able to download it, and he said within the uh, movies folder, the motion templates folder is empty, and he can't seem to locate the titles folder. Uh, and if you watch the video and go through this, I have you put this uh, into this folder so you see motion templates, titles, adjustment layer. So uh, if you're having any issues, please go on the website here, read the tips and everything that I have, uh, watch this video. It should answer all the questions that you have. But essentially, when you go into the Finder, you're going to go into your Movies folder, and you should see a Motion Templates folder. Um, if you have Motion installed, all of these should be have been created automatically. If they weren't, or if you don't have Motion, in order to use this adjustment layer, you're going to have to create these folders manually. Piece of cake, you don't have to do too much. Just control click or right click and say new folder or go up to the file menu and create a new folder. You're going to want to create one for motion templates. After you create that folder, uh, select it and press command I to get information about that folder. And make sure it has this dot localized uh, in the name of it. So you won't see it in the name here in the, the finder window. But when you select that folder and do command I to get information, it'll say motion templates dot localized. If you don't have the dot localized, Final Cut can't see it. You won't be able to see your, um, your adjustment layer. So then inside of motion te uh, templates, you're going to create a folder called titles. You can also create one called generators or anything else here, but you create one called titles. And then you're going to want to do Command I on that folder as well, get information, and you guessed it, add the dot localized to the end of that uh, folder as well. Then inside of that one, you're going to add all the downloads that are provided from the, the downloads page on anawesomeguide.com. So you'll have an adjustment layer folder. And if you do Command I for this folder, notice there's no dot localized on this one. You shouldn't need it. It's mostly on the, uh, the titles folder that you need. Um, so then we have that adjustment layer. And if we go back into Final Cut and we go into our titles, uh, we can see that I believe this one is not there yet. Yeah, so perfect. So this notice there's no adjustment layer showing up in Final Cut. This is the problem that a lot of people have. So what you actually need is to create a category for this adjustment layer. 
And if we go back to Safari, notice on here I have the in the, the folder, the list here that we have adjustment layer. That's the folder that you're going to put it into. So if I uh, control click, I'm going to say new folder. And I usually just have it also called adjustment layer. Uh, won't let me do it there. That's OK. We'll just put it inside here. And this may look a little confusing here, but essentially we're just doing motion templates, titles, adjustment layer, because that's the name of the category that's going to show up here under titles. And then the actual template, which is called adjustment layer, is inside of that. So hopefully that makes sense here. And then uh, sometimes it does it without having to quit. Yeah, if I just switch off and back, notice now we have the category for adjustment layer. And then inside of that, the actual adjustment layer template. Uh, so hopefully that uh, answers that question there. Um, yeah, and I see your comment there about the adjustment layer. Yeah, it's it's such a helpful thing to have that. Um, if you're not familiar with the adjustment layer, all it is is a, a basically an empty title. So if I click and drag this down, you're not going to see any change to the project right now. Uh, but I can add filters, effects, all kinds of different adjustments to this adjustment layer. Uh, so for example, um, I don't know, let's say I wanted to distort everything and flip things. I could add that to this adjustment layer. And notice now my picture is flipped, but it's only flipped when that adjustment layer is happening. And I can move this adjustment layer over here and let's move it halfway through the title I created. So again, before when I created that title, there it is. But if I go to the adjustment layer, it's flipped everything that's below that adjustment layer. And you could resize the adjustment layer. You could even do uh, transforms on them, which I see a lot of times uh, is you'll want to make things bigger or smaller for a little bit of time. You can do that using the adjustment layers there. So great way to, to work with it. Um, let me put up one other example. If I have my footage here. No, I don't think I do. but. The other, uh, essentially the other example I was going to do is if you're uh, working with video games, I'll use the shot as an example. Uh, a lot of times you'll want to quickly zoom into a specific area that's on the screen. So what you can do with an adjustment layer, and you can do this either with the transform tools or just in the uh, inspector here, you can increase the scale and maybe adjust the position uh, of where you actually want to zoom in because I want to zoom in maybe on our face here. And now, just for the area of the adjustment layer, it's going to zoom in. So if I play this adjustment layer with zoom in really close, and then when the adjustment layer is done, we zoom back out. And this, then, you can just reuse over and over again, right? So if I zoom in close here, I'm going to hold Option and just drag this adjustment layer over a couple times. And now, as we scrum, uh, skim through it, every time the adjustment layer comes up, it zooms in and out because when she drops it, whatever happens there, then we can zoom out, see your lab, zoom back in, right? So that's what an adjustment layer is for. Um, this is a very, very basic use of it, but you can apply all kinds of things to that layer, and it should be something that's built right into Final Cut. Unfortunately, it's not right now, so just go to an awesomeguide.com, and you can download that and get that installed uh, right on your own system there. All right, so that is what I have. If you have any other questions, uh, don't hesitate to put them in the comments there. Or again, like I said before, you can always email me and, and send them on over. Um, I don't th see anything else for right now. So we're going to bring this uh, this to a close. So as so I always do, I like to throw out a couple additional resources uh, that you can go to. Don't uh, You saw me use it. The help menu is so helpful inside of Final Cut. You can use it to search all of the menus. If you know something is there, just start typing in, uh, what the name of that command is, and it'll point you to exactly which uh, menu that's under, where that command is. Uh, but you can also search the entire Final Cut manual using the help menu. So I strongly recommend diving into that. Uh, otherwise, go on to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or like you are viewing here on YouTube, at Final Cut Pro Help. Uh, we have channels on all those. Instagram especially, posting all kinds of tips on there, shortcuts, uh, get you reminded, get you into editing. Uh, that's a great place to get some tips on there. Uh, otherwise, if there's a question I didn't answer on here that you have, you want me to answer, 
Again, I've mentioned it multiple times, Final Cut Pro help at b.com. Uh, you can send an email to me. I try to respond to all of those messages that come in. Otherwise, go to an awesomeguide.com. And you can see some other tips on there, like the download for the adjustment layers on there. And finally, it, people have asked for a way to support the channel. You can do that on Patreon, just patreon.com slash Final Cut Pro help. Uh, any donation you put there, always helpful, keeps me here instead of out doing other work. And that's what I have for you this first day of 2019. This has been Final Cut Pro Help Live. This was our 10th episode where we talked about dailies at the beginning. Thank you so much for watching. And don't hesitate when you do have additional questions. Uh, don't hesitate. Send them over to me. Post them. And we'll try to get you answered. And if there's anything else you need, we're always here waiting for uh, your messages to come in. So some people I know a lot of times hesitate because they're embarrassed of the question, whatever it is, just send in an email. No, uh, no judgment on this side. All right, everyone, have a wonderful rest of your day and happy new year.